Great men are born from fire. They are heated in it, beaten down to work the slag from the iron, and forged into swords able to carve a path through history. When one sword meets another, there is a clash, a spark, and for a moment, as these two forces strive against each other, awaiting the victory granted by Lul, the whole course of time stands in the balance. And for a brief moment, in 52 BC, the future of Europe and the Gallic people stood in the balance. On one side, Caesar. On the other, Vercingetorix. Hi, I'm Kevin McLean. If you'd like to support the channel, please check out the links below. He was born in around 82 BC in Gergovia, in South Central Gaul, to a noble family. His father, Celtillus, meaning the Little Celt, was a tribal king of the Arverni. He had been put to death by the oligarch leaders of the tribe for attempting to install himself as a dynastic king and seeking to unite and rule all of Gaul. It is possible that this attempt at a grand power play may have been in response to the invasion of Julius Caesar in 58 BC, but the exact time is unknown. Yet what is clear is that he had a great national ambition and this was something that he would pass on to his son. Vercingetorix's name means Great Warrior King, and he was most certainly raised to be just that. While we don't know any details about his childhood, we know from his later life that he was trained in leadership, politics, and military tactics, so much so that he may have been the first military leader in Europe to use scorched earth tactics. He must also have been intensely charismatic, for he not only was able to win the support among his own tribe, but to gain the support of most other tribes in Gaul in only a few short months. Depictions of him on coins show him as handsome and youthful. He was only 30 years old when he came face to face with the infamous Julius Caesar. He grew up in Gergovia, the tribal capital of the Arverni, a well-organized town situated on a plateau and defended by great stone walls. It and other towns like it throughout Gaul were the motivation behind Caesar's drive for conquest. With towns and productive agriculture and skilled trades came wealth, and he not only desired Gaul's wealth, he needed it. He was buried in debts, and his invasion of Gaul under false pretenses was perhaps primarily motivated by his need for gold. Gaul was a wealthy and well-organized society by 58 BC. They had expert craftsmen who exported goods to the Mediterranean, roads that connected their territories. They were well fed and ate more nutritiously than Romans and they were developing their own artistic and architectural styles influenced by the Mediterranean, but not identical to it. They were not primitive peoples, but had a highly sophisticated lifestyle and economy largely based on agriculture, which was not less technologically advanced than Roman agriculture at this time. Their weakness was political disunity, and it was along these fault lines that Caesar pushed in and found so much success. It isn't known what Vercingetorix was doing in the initial period of Roman invasion, but it might have been that, like many Gauls, they were not sure what to think. Caesar was a crafty statesman and military leader, and his main road through Gaul was carved along tribal fault lines. They wormed their way into every dispute made promises to whatever side suited them, and who would then be obliged to give loyalty to Caesar. 
tribal politics, though possessing various positive qualities, was unable to resist this type of maneuvering, which would play out again and again through the history of warfare. In a few short years, nearly all of Gaul was under the power of Caesar. Although there were many battles between Caesar and various individual Gaulish tribes, the desire for political unity was slow to develop. But by 54 BC, the situation had begun to change. The nobility was often the most reluctant to resist the Roman power, because they also had the possibility to gain from it. Many of them were being bought off, selling out their people for wine, status, or wealth. Yet the common people were becoming infuriated. The Eburones, a Belgic tribe, were the first to rebel when Caesar, just back from his second British expedition, decided to stay the winter in their territory and become a massive drain on their already dwindling food supplies due to a drought. The rebellion failed and was followed by a massive genocide that saw every village burnt and all their food destroyed. Caesar would return two years later to try and wipe out those who had survived his first attempt and had begun to rebuild. Actions like this fueled rage through Gaul and helped build the idea of uniting in order to resist. By 52 BC, when Caesar was raising troops in Cisalpine Gaul, the Carnutes launched a surprise uprising, initiating a massive purge of all Roman settlers and traders that they could find in their lands. Vercingetorix was eager to join them in their efforts, and he quickly called up his dependents. Yet his own actions proved unpopular with the rest of the Arverni elite, including his own uncle. When Vercingetorix insisted on participating in the uprising against Caesar, the oligarchs of the Arverni expelled him from their territory. Though Vercingetorix's decision to rise up against Rome was not popular with the elite or his uncle, it proved to be extremely popular with average people who began to flock to him to join his army. In little time he had won over to his cause a massive force, and with this army he turned and marched not on the Romans, but on Gargovia. He took the city and his supporters declared him king of the Arverni. Now in full command of his people, Vercingetorix hastily sent word to those tribes who he thought he could count on. The Senones, the Parisi, the Pictones, the Caduri, the Torones, the Auterci, the Lemovice, and all the rest of the Atlantic-dwelling Gauls. He understood what it would take to gain victory over Caesar, and he demanded hostages, troops, and likely a recognition of his position as what the Irish would have called High King. He told them that this was their best and only chance to free Gaul from foreign occupation and to stop the destruction of their peoples and way of life. The hostages, troops, and pledges all came in. There was a swelling feeling across Gaul that this man was their hope, though exactly how and why his leadership was so swiftly accepted by so many is not clearly understood from the surviving information. However, it is possible that secret meetings were taking place before this that had singled out Vercingetorix as their most capable leader, and it is likewise possible that the Druids played a role, pushing tribal leaders to accept and aid him. Weapons, troops, and horses poured into Vercingetorix from across Gaul, and he oversaw the training of the men himself, especially the cavalry. He attempted to discipline them and verse them in mass battlefield tactics, but he was operating on little time. Though some of his men were likely hardened veteran warriors, many more would have been primarily farmers or craftsmen. They were to stand against Caesar's highly experienced Roman legions. 
some of the best equipped and trained soldiers anywhere in the world. Yet Vercingetorix was also not without skilled men under his command. One of these was Lucterius of the Cadurci, whom the king would entrust a great military force to, and whose trust was not misplaced, for he would prove both cunning and loyal to the end. Learning of these developments, Caesar moved north as quickly as he could, stopping temporarily in the territory of the Helvi. High mountains stood between the Helvi and the Arverni territory, and it was already winter, with heavy snow. But Caesar managed to force his way through the pass, mobilizing his soldiers to dig the entire way. Their appearance shocked the Arverni, who sent desperate word to Vercingetorix to come and help them. Yet the Romans marched instead to the territories of the Bituriges and seized a number of towns, fighting small engagements with forces of Vercingetorix, which had resulted in their defeat. It was then that Vercingetorix employed a scorched earth tactic. Rather than engaging directly, they burned down all the villages and secured all the grain with the army. However, apparently due to the pleading of the Bituriges, Vercingetorix allowed one place to stand against his better judgment, Avericum. It was of course here that the Romans next targeted. The defenders of Avericum held out for weeks against the Romans, who were slowly being starved to death by Vercingetorix. The king's army would prevent supplies from reaching Caesar, disrupt foraging attempts, and would set the very countryside aflame. Yet driven by hunger and the knowledge that food awaited them on the other side of the walls, after a hard fight, the Romans were finally able to overcome the walls of Avericum and kill everyone within some 40,000 people. Yet despite the loss of Avericum, the prestige of Vercingetorix grew, perhaps because it had proved that his advice had been sound from the start. Had they listened, Avericum and its valuable grain supplies would never have fallen to Caesar. More tribes signed on, and sent hostages and men to support him. All the archers of Gaul were called into his service. At this time he falls back to Gergovia to regroup, burning all the bridges along the river Alaire. When Caesar pursues him, Rome's long-standing Gallic allies, the Aedui, rebel. Caesar must take time to deal with them, attempting to win them back. Then they march on Gergovia and take up position beyond the city, securing also a nearby hill in a nighttime raid. After several days of intense skirmishes, Caesar's forces are defeated at the walls of Gergovia. He falls back and tries to lure Vercingetorix into a pitched battle, but the crafty Celt refuses to engage, instead continuing his strategy of using cavalry to harass and diminish the Roman supplies. Then, the Aedui rebel again against Caesar, this time for good. Facing the rebellion of his allies, and the unwillingness of Vercingetorix to engage him in direct battle, Caesar falls back. With Caesar defeated before Gergovia, and left with only a handful of Gallic allies, a great council is held by all the tribes of Gaul in Bibracte, modern-day Autun, in Burgundy, the capital of Rome's former allies, the Aedui. Only the Treveri, Remi, and Lingones do not attend, as they were the only remaining Roman allies. The Council of Tribes declared Vercingetorix, the commander of the United Gallic Armies, after obtaining hostages from all the participating Gallic tribes and 15,000 horses, he dispatches troops for the liberation of several tribes still in the grips of the Romans. Meanwhile, Caesar went to the Lingones and recruited large numbers of Germanic mercenaries before heading to Gallia Narbonensis, 
It was here that Vercingetorix finally decided to give open battle to the Romans. The battle commander of the United Gallic Army had now assembled a massive cavalry force. Caesar put that number at 15,000, large enough for Vercingetorix to feel confident in ordering a direct cavalry charge on Caesar's forces, whom he believed would be hindered as they were on the march and laden with baggage. However, the Roman legions, especially those who had been fighting under Julius Caesar for years in Gaul, were very experienced and they knew just how to respond. The cavalry attack resulted in a large loss for Vercingetorix's forces. Disoriented and demoralized from the loss, Vercingetorix moved his forces to the defensive position of nearby Alessia. Caesar quickly pursued and made camp outside the hill fort on the next day. Though he still had superior numbers, Vercingetorix knew that in a direct confrontation, the superior equipment and training of the Romans would be difficult to overcome. Further, they had limited supplies to support the army under siege. For these reasons, he ordered all the remaining cavalry to return to their tribes and assemble all the forces that could be brought to bear to relieve the siege and crush Caesar at the same time, like steel between the hammer and the anvil. Had he not been dealing with one of the greatest military generals in history, there is little doubt that this plan would have resulted in victory for the Gauls. As the riders raced out from Alessia, Vercingetorix prepared to wait, ordering a strict rationing of the available food and having the old, sick women and children leave. So that Vercingetorix and his army could not escape, Caesar built up a large defensive ditch and fence. Yet when he learned that a massive relief army was forming that would be able to hit him from behind, he had a novel idea. He ended up building a donut-shaped defense where the Romans had closed in Alessia and had also walled out the relief army. It was an enormous task of labor for his troops, and only their immense experience in building camp fortifications, as well as their strict discipline, enabled them to pull it off before the arrival of the Gallic forces. All the while, there were intense clashes taking place between the Romans and the Gallic army trapped in Alessia. Vercingetorix tested the Roman defenses daily, looking for weak points in order to break through, and this frenzy of attack accelerated when the encircled warriors saw the massive relief army on the horizon. Possibly between two and three hundred thousand brave Gauls had assembled to assist Vercingetorix, and they fought ferociously to break through the fortifications of Caesar. But they were not being led by the clever command of Vercingetorix, nor did the king have any way to communicate with the relief army. Again, the Gauls find themselves divided, just as Caesar had managed to do for years. After days of fighting, a final great push is made to break through the defenses. Vercingetorix leads his men, attacking anywhere along the fortifications that seem weakened, and at the same time the relief forces attack the outer defenses. Had they succeeded in breaking through, the Roman forces would have been swept away, but Caesar, seeing the danger, himself charged into battle, rallying his troops and making a last desperate push. The relief army then came under attack from behind by a Roman sally. Exhausted from their efforts and smashed by Caesar's assault, they break and retreat, but are intercepted by the Germanic cavalry. The battle turns into a slaughter. Perhaps over a hundred thousand Gauls are killed that day. Seeing this terrible result, Vercingetorix recognizes with great sorrow that he has been defeated. Not wanting to have his men or his people suffer needlessly, knowing the battle had already been decided, he offered himself up to his nobles, 
who decided the best course was to surrender to Caesar and hand over their king. The next morning they rode out, cast their weapons down at the feet of Caesar. Vercingetorix was taken as prisoner and kept as such for five years before the triumph for Caesar through Rome, after which he was strangled to death. But for a single decision or a few misplaced sword strikes, Vercingetorix might well have been the true High King of Gaul, having united the tribes and defeated the invaders who had come so close to complete conquest. Yet it was not to be. Many Gauls were killed, many enslaved, but there were those who carried on the fight. Lucterius, one of Vercingetorix's chosen generals, still with part of his army intact, continued the struggle against Rome for a year longer, engaging in hit-and-run tactics, eventually losing his base of power in Gaul. He and his men disappeared into German territory, never to be seen again. Just like Lucterius ended up fleeing Gaul at this time, likely it was true of many other displaced nobles who had fought against Rome and now found themselves on the outside, and some may well have found themselves in Britain, Ireland, and other Germanic regions. But the memory of brave men, of great men, like Vercingetorix, whether they succeeded or whether they failed, lives on, even now, over 2,000 years later. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please like, subscribe, and check out our Patreon page. And as always, stand tall.